Okay, uh, so now let's come to the last part of the uh, uh, today's lecture. Now, uh, so far we have been looking at cosmic rays. The cosmic rays can go up to certain energies. I say, for example, I told you that they can reach fluxes uh, energies of the order of 10 to uh, 22 uh, eV. But that is at the cost of an extremely, extremely small flux. So, if you want to see an event with those energies or some uh, with any high energy, say for example. Uh, the flux is very very small as i said it falls off very rapidly with energy with a power of around uh, two or something uh, it falls off pretty rapidly exponential uh, e power minus two energy power minus two so it keeps falling off pretty fast and so if you want to create particles of heavier and heavier energies with cosmic rays you really have to wait a long 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 time so the kaons and pions were discovered using cosmic rays but then uh, people started looking at uh, laboratory production for the heavier particles. Around the same time, uh, the accelerators were created. So there were these accelerators, which were uh, basically created in Lawrence, uh, synchrotron, cyclotron in the 1950s. So people were really accelerating these particles, we were able to accelerate this uh, Van de Graaff generator, um, uh, accelerate these particles and then hit into uh, a fixed target, something like a Rutherford experiment, but then you hit it into a fixed target, and then this can generate a lot of energy. So you can accelerate this particle, it could be a proton or uh, most, uh, or any of these things, which could, or an electron, which could be very, very highly accelerated, hit into a fixed target. Those are called the fixed target experiments, and then generate uh, enough energy to produce particles. But in the late 60s, uh, early 60s and late 60s, um, the idea of colliders came into picture. Colliders say that, okay, I accelerate both the particles, not just one particle. Okay, I accelerate both the particles. So both these particles are accelerated and they meet at a certain point, which I call, I modify, uh, set up my experiment in such a way that they meet at a certain point and the collision takes place. And the center of mass energy would be much, much, much higher compared to a fixed target experiment. So, for example, then you would really gain in the center of mass energy, right? Essentially, that instead of having a fixed target in which one of them is not moving and the other one is moving. So, here you have two particles which are both having, say, the same acceleration coming together. And so, the center of mass values would be around twice the, uh, that, uh, the energy of the accelerator particle. Whereas in a fixed target, it will be, uh, the energy, the center of mass energy would be roughly the energy of the accelerator particle. One of the, so here I present one of the first uh, accelerators, which was presented, uh, which was uh, constructed at Frascati in Italy uh, in the 1960s, uh, uh, where this idea of uh, how to, uh, first collider, I'm sorry, electron positron collider was constructed, um, which was very, very small collider. Compared to the present standards, I think it's extremely, uh, extremely high. So, most of this, the difference between accelerators and uh, fixed target experiment and uh, colliders uh, would be covered in the simple high energy physics course. Uh, but for those who are not attending that course, I just uh, try to give you an uh, overview that fixed target means that one of the uh, particles is not accelerating. It is standalone. It's almost like a Rutherford scattering experiment, and the other particle is accelerated and comes and hits it. Collider means both the particles are accelerated, and they come together and then bombard and give you a collider carry more energy. So uh, here I give you a very nice uh, short uh, history of the colliders. So you can see that uh, there is. Uh, uh, colliders right from the uh, 60s all the way up to present. Uh, as you can see, uh, there are these uh, various discoveries associated with the colliders. Uh, the green ones are uh, E plus C minus colliders, and then there are these colliders which are called EP colliders, electron and proton colliders. One of the most important ones is the HERA experiment. 
at day C. And then there are the hadron colliders, which are essentially proton and proton or proton and antiproton, like uh, Tevatron. All of them have led to the discoveries. As you can see, uh, the spear, one of the first ones which were helped in the discovery of uh, a char charm particle, a charm quark, uh, was in 1974 by the spear at the Stanford Slack. Uh, 1974, it led to the discovery of gypsi or we'll come to the story in a second and later on to the tau, uh, tau lepton. Then the Petra in Daisy led to the discovery of the gluon and uh, we have, oh, okay, the B quark is not covered here, the B quark is some sort of a fixed target experiment here, okay, uh, we'll come to the discovery also. And then there is the W and Z as SPS uh, colliders at CERN, which will be dis uh, we'll discussed in the next lecture. And the Tevatron, which discovered the top quark, in which we also had some sort of contribution. And uh, the LEP collider, which had the important conclusion that there are only three families in standard models. And the LSC, which discovered the Higgs boson. Now, on the y axis, you have this, huge, uh, this thing, which is essentially the center of mass. Now, you see. Uh, the energy of uh, the center of mass energy. Now you see, the initially they started with 1 GeV, okay, 1 GeV, the slack went up to 10 GeV. And then about 100 GeV, at LEP it was around 100, 200 GeV center of mass. And now they are sitting at uh, 14 TeV center of mass of uh, LHC, which will be starting soon in a couple of years or so. Uh, till now it ran at 13 TV. Okay. <clears throat> so now let's uh, uh, understand. So, so far uh, we have discovered the mesons. These mesons, uh, the pion contains, can be considered, uh, considered in terms of up and down quarks. So they have been uh, they, uh, uh, designated as bound states of up and down quarks. And then the kion contains a strange meson, so the, the strange quark. So the k mesons are essentially all the uh, bound states which can be formed with the k uh, strange quark. So we now have uh, discovered three quarks, essentially u, d, and s. The three quarks were for a long time only three quarks was considered to be the up to the seventies that people thought that there were only three quarks. Theoretically, uh, there was uh, uh, an experimental uh, 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 reason to consider, uh, there was a theoretical reason to consider the existence of a fourth quark called Charmonium. So three people called uh, Glasho, Iliapolis, and Miami predicted the existence of uh, a charm quark to solve one of the puzzles, which I told you that essentially that tau theta puzzle. So people were looking for this uh, charm quark. Uh, uh, so it has to be found at, uh, uh, as a bound state, of course, but it will be at a much, much heavier state. But as with any particle in standard model, people don't know what the mass of this charm quark is. This is the one of the drawbacks of standard model that the standard model doesn't predict what the masses of these particles are. Though it predicts that they all have masses, they know the mechanism. It doesn't tell you what is energy or what are the mass ranges. So people were looking at this uh, requirement of a charm quark whether it to exist or not. So it was discovered by two different groups, uh, one at the East Coast and one at the West Coast, if you want to call it as that way. On the right hand side is a group left by Sam Ting and on the left hand side is the group led by Richter Rosenschild. It's like. So they discovered this charm quark independently almost at the same time. Actually uh, the story goes that Sam Ting discovered it much earlier but he wanted to make sure that uh, it is really the charm quark. He wanted to be made very, very sure of his experimental data that he sat on it for a long time. While he was verifying the data and everything, 
Richter came to know the news that uh, something had discovered it, and so he immediately announced the results. As soon as they announced the results, something had to announce its results too. So one of them called it a J meson, the other called it as a psi meson. Okay, it is a bond state of two charm quarks, so C C bar bond state. Uh, so which led to the discovery of the charm quark, charm and anti and charm. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, charm and anti charm, uh, and it, uh, it as you can see, it has a mass around uh, say a few uh, about uh, five to six uh, uh, g the charm quark. So right now, so because each group named its own nomenclature, it is called as gypsy. Okay, and the bottom, I'll show you uh, the graph uh, how it is seen nowadays. At the let's see, on the left hand, uh, on the bottom you see something called a J slash psi. This is the charm bound state essentially C bar C, which is also produced at LHC because now you know that this is called a charmonium, a charm uh, gypsy charmonium state. So this is how it's seen. But see the nomenclature. Both the groups kept their names, and so people started calling that as J slash psi gypsy meson. So which is an interesting theory on its own. Something uh, is also involved in very famous experiment right now, uh, which is called uh, uh, AMS experiment, which is being conducted from CERN. It is uh, uh, famous for its extremely uh, fantastic technology in space. It's a space-based experiment where accelerator technology is being used, and so accelerators are very complicated. Accelerators and detectors are extremely complicated objects. And uh, something is leading the experiment uh, uh, where this technology is being put in space. This AMS instrument has been uh, very important for dark matter because it measures uh, uh, positronian spectrum at a very, very high precision uh, at uh, in the galactic uh, medium, essentially in the galactic. In the galactic, uh, uh, in 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 the bulk, uh, uh, in the uh, in the halo of the galaxy, essentially, if you want to say. So it forms something called the indirect test of the dark matter. Actually. So this AM experiment is led by this person called uh, Professor Sam Ping. He is a well-known experimentalist. So with this, we have the fourth quark, which is called uh, the charm quark. So we filled out of the six quarks we had discovered four quarks. The tau lepton was discovered uh, uh, in the next year, in 1975, at Slack um, by Martin Pearl and company. So this was uh, uh, <coughs> a discovery. Uh, so there were some theoretical ideas which they proposed that there should be a tau lepton uh, uh, and so uh, the person along with Martin Pleyel and company at Slack using the sphere collider which we saw in the graph table, they started looking for the tau lepton they, of course they also didn't know the mass I think uh, Zukiki also was looking at it but he didn't have the energy uh, this was um, a bit earlier, 19, uh, 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 late 60s or early 70s. He was only trying to look for this tau lepton, but uh, he uh, he didn't have enough energy to produce the tau lepton. The tau lepton has a mass around one uh, around close to 2 GeV, so 1.75 GeV, and it decays. Uh, so their discovery mode was one of the tau it, to pair produce tau's. It won't form a bound state because it's not a uh, colored particle. It doesn't. It's not a. These are leptons. They don't have strong interactions. Uh, we'll see it again in the next lecture. We'll see the interaction part of this thing. The tau lepton. One of the tau's will decay into a muon, and uh, so the muon will be discovered. Uh, and the other one will decay into an electron mode. Actually. So this is the discovery channel, uh, which is a Mark One detector, and this is actually the sphere. Well, sorry, sphere collider in uh, 
and slack. Now with the discovery of uh, the Thaulepton and uh, uh, Champ Quark, uh, people were uh, thought that they had discovered all the fundamental particles, but it was not sure whether there could be more. Okay. So uh, in 1977, uh, uh, they found another particle, which is they call it as the bottom quark. This was uh, uh, discovered in Fermilab. Uh, this was discovered in Fermilab. Well, uh, they were uh, look okay. Uh, they were all, uh, they were not sure whether it was a charmonium or it was something else. So they were actually looking at some process called trillion, in which you actually hit particles, uh, which are uh, hit protons, on a on another, uh, uh, they were looking at, they are hitting at uh, uh, fixed target, they were really looking at uh, nuclei uh, essentially. So protons are hit on a fixed target and they are looking at, so they are looking at leptons produced in this particular process. So they were looking at muons mostly. And uh, so they were looking at uh, muons and they found a resonance of uh, muons. So this Drillian production, Drillian is a process in which the hadrons inter interact, like I said, you can have a hadron antihadron or a quark anti-quark pair which annihilates into energy and this energy can decay into anything, it could also decay into a pair of leptons. The process in which it decays into a pair of leptons is called Drillian process. So Leon Lederman um, at Fermilab was hitting uh, 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 protons on fixed targets uh, and looking at muons. So they improved the experiment and they suddenly found the resonance around uh, this energy essentially. <coughs> so this energy is around the uh, epsilon masses. This is a bottom, uh, it's a bound state of, uh, so this is energy which is in um, dimion channel, okay, with an energy of uh, the bottom quark roughly has a mass of around 4.5 g, 4.6 g. So that means this bound state would roughly have a mass around 10 GeV, so 9 to 10 GeV. So and it has various, uh, these bound states would have various degrees, uh, various uh, uh, what do you call um, uh, levels essentially. So this, uh, um, the, uh, this, this meson, this particular meson is called an uh, Upsilon meson which was uh, discovered in 1977 by this, which is a bound state of bottom anti uh, quark. Now, once the bottom quark was discovered, there was no doubt that there exists a counterpart to the bottom quark, which is called the top quark. Okay. So by this time, the standard model has already been sort of established and people already believed in the standard model theory. The theory part of the standard model has already been uh, Sort of established, okay, so people had no doubt there should be uh, the top quark, but they didn't know what is the energy of the top quark was or what is the mass of the top quark was. It took a long time, almost twenty years, further to discover the top quark. Uh, the top quark again was discovered at Fermilab. Uh, this is one of the experiments at uh, Fermilab. Fermilab uh, has an accelerator or a collider called Tevatron, which contain which goes through with uh, a proton and an antiproton. A proton and an antiproton go in circles, then uh, collide with each other at two different specific points which are essentially uh, where the exponents are placed. So one of them is called CDF, the other one is called D0. There is um, an Indian, uh, I think Josna was also part of it, I think, uh, an Indian group which is uh, part of this uh, D0 group, <coughs> which when the uh, uh, top quark was discovered in 1995. So the top quark was discovered by this process, which you can see it here. 
again um, it is a process in which there is one particular jet which is called a B jet and then another one would be decaying into W and a muon and neutrino. So the top is produced, pair produced, top and the top is pair produced and the top core decays into a B core and a W boson and the W boson decays into a muon and a neutrino. So this two took, uh, so you look for two uh, B jets and two muons. So, okay, right now you may not understand all the details of this one, but particularly, but these are the final states you look at in the product. So there is a, uh, this one recently won uh, the EPS prize for one of, one of the fundamental discoveries actually. Uh, so with this, we have discovered all the 20, uh, six quarks, uh, which are essentially up, down, which we uh, to revise essentially is the uh, uh, are essentially from the pions, strange quark which is essentially the kaons, uh, kaon mesons, charm quark which is essentially the gypsy, bottom quark which again is the epsilon which we discussed just now and the top and the top uh, quarks. The top and the top don't really uh, form bond state because they're extremely short-lived. The top doesn't have time to hydronize or they don't have time to form bond states because they're extremely heavy particles. We will look into the uh, details of uh, the lifetimes uh, a bit later, but uh, yeah, I leave some material in, uh, um, in the classroom section, which essentially tells you that uh, which uh, uh, gives you the, uh, all the properties of the top quark. Uh, essentially, what its lifetime is. Uh, and uh, now you can ask the question what is its hydronizing time? time is. We we'll look into these properties. And I'll also provide you a link to something called the particle data group, which you can look into it in the reading materials for the class. Now, with this, we have discovered. Um, uh, uh, we covered all the quarks which have been discovered and all the leptons except the neutrinos. Uh, in the next class, we'll cover all the bosons essentially, most of the bosons except for the Higgs boson. Now, let's go into the most recent discovery just to uh, discuss us, uh, just to set some sort of enthusiasm into the class, uh, which is essentially the Higgs boson. So, the Higgs boson um, was required in the standard model to give masses to the quarks and leptons as well as for the gauge bosons. So, the, technically, as we will see um, uh, along the class, it is very, very important because it carries out something called the spontaneous symmetry breaking, which gives the standard model a renounceable theory, which makes the standard model as a renounceable theory. So, it's a very, very, very important missing puzzle of the standard model and it has not been discovered for such a long time and people didn't know what it was. There were several indirect measurements, indirect ideas and indirect uh, 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 what do you call uh, uh, indications that the Higgs mass should be around this range, so below 250 GeV and uh, above 80 GeV, so on and so but they didn't know what the mass range is. So people started looking at uh, theories where the Higgs boson is not really required. So people started building something called the Higgsless theories of the standard model, in which the Higgs boson is not required, but it does all the jobs of the Higgs boson. So these are extremely complicated theories, which also go under the name as uh, uh, technical. Okay, so whereas in these models, uh, there is no Higgs boson, but uh, the standard model symmetry is broken by some other methods which are called the dynamical symmetry. So the Higgs boson was extremely important object to be seen A to understand how the uh, masses of these particles are obtained B and how the symmetry of the electric, uh, how the electric symmetry is broken. These are the two important things which were extremely important and which have to be seen. <coughs> 
So at the LHC, uh, when the LHC was built, so it was um, uh, hoping to see the Higgs boson. Actually, the left collider was with it, just mixed the Higgs boson, uh, collider, Higgs boson. Uh, because it found the limit on the lower limit on the Higgs boson mass to be around 115 GeV. So the LHC is a much larger and much uh, energetic machine. So here I show you the accelerator of the LHC, uh, accelerator ring of the LHC, which is uh, this patch uh, or the white patch here at the bottom is essentially the Genu airport and this entire ring about 27 kilometers. In uh, circumference is the LHC ring and these dotted lines uh, which you see are uh, the the Indo uh, uh, Swiss France uh, France border line. It's a huge machine where the center of masses of these particles can go all the way up to uh, uh, about uh, uh, 13 G and if it works uh, and, we, and the new improvement uh, uh, will make it up almost up to 14 G, uh, 14 GV. Now there are several experiments, about seven experiments at LHC, but the most important ones are, are the ones which are sort of located underground. Why underground? Because you want to avoid the cosmic rays. Because if the, uh, as you said, cosmic, as we see in the cosmic rays are all permeable because they are always there. So they can interfere with the experiments. With, uh, we don't want those rays to come and uh, spoil the experimental details. Essentially, what we are trying to see. So these are uh, so these are essentially built underground and with a huge amount of shielding, so that uh, you get a, a quite a bit of shielding from cosmic rays. So there are uh, several experiments, as I said, six to seven, but the most important ones, which are called the general purpose experiments, which are called the CMS and the Atlas, which are here and there. You can see it in the figure. There are other experiments called LHC, B, Alice, and there is also Razor, Major Sevens. The CMS and Atlas are general purpose, uh, purpose uh, detectors which were essentially used to discover the, uh, the Higgs boson. So, how do you expect the Higgs boson to be produced at uh, LHC? Before that, let's just see. What this uh, atlas and CMS look like? This is the accelerator tunnel on the left hand side. On the right hand side is how the atlas detector looks. It is huge, but its density is much, much less. And the bottom is a CMS experiment, which is uh, a compact muon solenoid, which is very, very dense, which is very, very heavy. And India has a significant contribution. India and many Asian countries, including Pakistan, have significant contribution in building this detector. We supply our, our own value has produced uh, electronics as well as uh, um, magnetic plates required for this detector. This is the accelerators, and uh, uh, and this one, uh, the Atlas detector. Uh, India is not a part of the Atlas detector, but India is a part of the same detector. So these red things are huge magnets, and. Uh, in our own department, we have members of the CMS uh, um, collaboration. Uh, magnets, and uh, some of these magnets have been supplied from India, like I said, there is like uh, DHL and Bell, both of them are involved, based in Bangalore, are involved in these uh, detectors. And the advanced uh, CMS, which is going to come up, uh, upgraded CMS detector, which is going to come up in a few years from now, BEL is involved uh, in Bangalore, Bharat Now, how do you expect to produce the Higgs boson at uh, the LHC? So LHC is essentially a proton-on-proton -proton collider. Uh, so you have it's not proton-antiproton; -proton, it's just proton-on-proton. -proton. So what happens is one of the gluons from uh, the proton comes up, another gluon comes from the other proton. It fuses. This is called the gluon fusion, and it fuses through this loop diagram, which is shown in this Feynman diagram, and it produces the Higgs. 
So this is the dominant production channel of the uh, Higgs boson. Gluons are essentially the mediator of strong force. We'll go into the details of it in the next lecture, but just for completeness, let me go through this. This diagram which I have shown is something called the Feynman diagram. We will go into the details of this, how do you draw these diagrams and everything through the course of this lecture. But as an overview, let me just continue. There are other production channels also in which we have instead these gluons produce top quarks and one of the top quarks, top or anti-top quark pair producers comes together and produces an explosion. Otherwise, there could be a quark coming from one of the protons, anti-quark coming from another proton which produces W and Z and that one of them just becomes, gives out the uh, Higgs. Similarly in this particular fashion on the fourth plane. These are sort of the production, uh, various mechanisms through which the Higgs is produced and then it's Now then we also have to detect uh, uh, the Higgs would decay and so these decays we have to see. Uh, so we should be able to find out the Higgs. Remember that we don't know what the mass of the Higgs is. So, people have computed for a given mass of the Higgs what could be its decay rate. So, assuming the standard moment is correct. Okay. On the x axis, you have the Higgs mass. On the y axis, is a, you have the branching fraction for a particular decay rate. Okay. And so, you see uh, the branching fraction is very, very, very small. It goes 10 power minus 3. It's 1. So it's a thousand part, okay? Ten power minus six thousand part. We go to definitions of this. So for a mass which is around between say hundred and two hundred, there's a small peak here which shows Z and gamma. So that means the when Higgs or and next to it, it's a small peak with gamma gamma. It's a between eighty and so one hundred and fifty or something. So this is the peak in which Two photons are expected if the mass of the Higgs boson lies in this particular region. The rest of them are BB bar, WW. Remember, the proton, it's a uh, TLC is a proton proton collider. So you find a lot of these things through various other processes, also, not just through the production of the Higgs boson. It's a very, very messy collider. Uh, this aspect will be again covered, maybe we'll do it in much more greater detail. Um, uh, when we discuss the Higgs boson in uh, the class, in one of the lectures, later lectures, but just to, for compliments, let's just say that. So the point I'm trying to make is that if it's just two photons, there is no real background. So you don't really expect two photons coming out of from a hadronic collider unless it produces the Higgs boson. But its branching fraction is extremely small. So you really have to see a very, very uh, uh, a rare process within the Higgs boson. And this is uh, what happens for a heavier Higgs boson. Like I said, you don't know what the mass of the Higgs boson is. So, so you need to You need to see what this is. <coughs> but anyway, uh, now let's continue. Um, so people were looking at all possibilities because what happens with the Higgs boson. So the LHC has a discovery range between 100 GeV to all the way up, uh, say 115 GeV, all the way up to 700 GeV Higgs mass. So people were looking at the Higgs mass between all this range and trying to figure out where the Higgs mass is. So in that process, this gamma gamma only is important for a very, very narrow range of the Higgs mass, as you can see. Finally, uh, in 2012, while looking at the gamma gamma channel, they found a small peak here and a very, very light Higgs boson around 125 G, not 600, not 400, not 300. This is what quantum field theory also likes because it, uh, the quantum field theory would prefer a very, very light Higgs boson. Okay, not uh, maybe even lighter than 125, but it turned out that it should be 125. Maybe there could be other reasons why it's 125, which you don't understand yet. So, 
this was the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012, which was the triumph of a uh, really great effort by experimentalist theorist and many other people actually. So with this, uh, we have sort of uh, covered this sort of a picture for the standard model particles. So here you have up and down quarks in purple, string, uh, quarks all in purple and leptons all in green. We'll come to this red part later on tomorrow and the yellow part is covered which is the Higgs boson. So you have all these purple particles and, and we'll see how to count them properly because right now you just see them as six quarks and there are these six leptons. We didn't cover the uh, neutrinos, uh, the discovery of these neutrinos, maybe much later. And we'll also see the discovery of these particles later on. And then the Higgs boson in the late future. So we have covered most of these particles. These, the red ones are the force carriers. And this is another matter particle, which is sort of matter and also mediated. So it's in between, okay. So this is an interesting timeline. So as you can see, it took about 100 years to cover the entire particle spectrum of the sun. Okay. So it's not something it started in maybe 1880. Oh, it's almost 120 years, uh, 140 years actually, if you really count it that way. Actually, it almost uh, uh, 130 years to really find all the particles of the standard model. It's a very, very long process and peppered with many Nobel Prizes and many misses also. There were many people who didn't get Nobel Prizes actually. Irrespective of the Nobel Prizes, but uh, this seems to be the uh, discovery. Uh, uh, these are extremely hard and difficult uh, discoveries and which is really a triumph of human spirit actually. And each of these discoveries has its own story, very detailed, very interesting. So I recommend books like uh, Second Creation, uh, which have uh, details of these stories actually. So with this, I finished the first lecture. And in the next lecture, I'll do some part of the units, uh, which I promised to do it in the first lecture, but I didn't have time. So I'll do some part of the units and also cover the discovery of the W and G bosons and the gluon and uh, some basic concept, uh, concepts of quantum mechanics. Not, I won't be able to cover much because uh, I have my own uh, course to cover before moving into um, STR and uh, trying to construct, uh, um, understand nature in terms of uh, the interactions essentially, uh, like uh, QD and everything. Okay. So with this, uh, this is the first lecture. And remember on Friday, we have a contact alert. Don't forget. Okay. Thank you. See you at the next lecture.